Okay. Thank you, Joey, for meeting me and taking the time. Like, it's it's awesome. I was like, oh my god, what if he's if he's coming and it's just it's kind of surreal. Like, you're like a like a famous engineer, you know? So, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I, you know, I always tell people I'm a I'm an open book. I'll talk to anybody. Um, actually, I I think something I'm really good at is just answering questions. I don't know why, but I'm good at that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this no, no, this no, is no. like second nature to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I've always known who you are. I've known who you were are. Um, obviously listen to all the records that you put out, which are some of my favorite albums. And then I was, um, so like I'm a freelance mixing engineer. Um, and I think I, f I saw your interview with Graham and Graham, I've learned, um, mixing from, um, just like the fundamentals, what he does and how humble the guy is. And just, he was great. I've learned so much from him. And then I saw your interview and the reason I want, I really, I was like, it was just like, I don't know if it was serendipity or whatever coincidence, but then you're like, Hey, I'll jump on somebody's podcast. And I was like, no way. Like this, this would be perfect. But like your, up, <laughs> your upbringing, like your style, everything was like, like it just, there's so many things like, and I'm sure we, we can talk about it. Um, but I was like, yes, this is, this is great. Um, so first, um, let's see for people who don't know you, um, anyone who doesn't know Joey, Joey is a gold certified mixing engineer. Um, and you worked with, uh, one of my favorite bands, the devil wears Prada. Um, and I wanted to ask you like about that in a little bit and then asking Alexandria, bless the fall, I see stars, all these, we came as Romans, awesome bands. I mean, those records are like novel. They're going to go down in history forever. Like you just, you have that <laughs> sound like your sonic footprint. Um, Let's see what else. I have a little bit of a script. You do Sturgis Tones. Um, yeah, Joey Sturgis Tones, our plug-in company. Yep. Yeah, and I wanted to give you a chance, like at the end, the least I could do for you for taking the time to talk to me is to give you a chance to plug you know, your stuff. Um, sure. And then um, I think you have a podcast out too, right? Yeah, well, I'm part of uh, URM Academy, which is like an online school for metal and rock engineers. And yeah. part of that uh, academy, we have a URM podcast yeah awesome awesome okay and uh i think so you went so i wanted to ask about that too real quick because for i i kind of forgot um and then so to go gold back in the day when people used to buy what are those called cds people cut albums or whatever <laughs> on itunes <laughs> when people used to buy those what yeah. what did it take was it like five hundred thousand copies or something like that yeah you had to, you had to purchase five hundred thousand uh units um i think it was like it depends on what time period you're talking about, but it was, you know, it always started with physical. Yeah. So, you know, to get a gold record, you needed to sell 500 physical units, which oh, is, 500. or 500,000 500. physical units, yeah. which is hard to do. Yeah. Uh, these yeah. days they've equated some sort of um, formula for calculating music video views, streams, and digital downloads along with the physical purchases yeah. to, to equate to uh, still that 500,000 unit number, but you know, maybe it's three, 3,500 music video views equals one purchase or something like that. Yeah. And, that's um, what we were trying to figure yeah. out. I couldn't, cause now it's like with streams on Spotify. So I'm like, I wonder how they can calculate that now, but it just has a feeling that it's maybe a lot more harder to do it nowadays. I mean, I could be wrong. Um, I would say it's easier, honestly, like, yeah. Either way, it's hard to get like getting someone, you know, 500,000 purchases of anything is, a, is like a miracle. So that means yeah. you have a you know a good product. Yeah. Getting a gold record is really hard because that means people bought the entire album. Yeah. Um, and I think this I don't know how the streaming works for that. But yeah, I, you know, I have like three of them now. Um, actually, there's one right there. I haven't hung it up yet, oh, but awesome. That one's for Of Mice and Men. <laughs> That's, again, oh, I forgot to mention Of Mice, one of my favorite bands too. Oh my God, like that, those albums still to this day, I just, I love them. And I wanted to tell you when I first heard Asking, Ale Alex Asking Alexandria and Of Mice and Men, I first heard those albums like back when I was like in college. And it's funny, I wanted to tell you, it was kind of like, they're aggressive and made me uncomfortable in a good way. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I know it's the weirdest way to describe it. Um, but and I was like, and there's just something that, but it made me want to keep listening. And, um, I just, to those days, I, I love the, love those albums. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was definitely in a, in a zone. Um, I was doing record after record after record and it was kind of, 
you know, I think you get to a point where as a producer, you can, you can develop a, a pretty, um, a recognizable sound that people, you know, enjoy. And one, as soon as one band takes that sound and does something great with it, then there's going to be three or four others to follow. Right. Yeah. So I kind of got, I was in the lucky seat there to, to kind of catch wind of that trend. And I was a part of helping move it along as well, but you know, it just I became like the go-to guy for a metalcore record, um, and there were some other people that were the go-to guys for different portions of this genre. Like, you know, the the more metal metalcore bands would probably go to you know Jason Sukoff or Adam Adam D. Um, Adam Duckowitz is that his name? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the the more um, uh, for lack of a better description, the more emo leaning stuff would be maybe go to like Chris Crummett or, you know, Cameron Mazzell. Yeah. Yeah. So like between like four or five, six guys, all of us like had like a grasp on the entire genre yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Boy, I could talk. Uh, thank you for sharing that, um, Joey. Like I could talk to you about that forever and I want to be mindful of your time um, and try to get these questions in um, for you. But the one that I selfishly want to have you talk about, and I'm sure you shared and I loved it. I actually took a little snippet from Graham's interview, and I was like, oh, this is the one that gave me the wave of relief, was your beginning. Your beginning. You didn't. You don't have an audio engineering degree, correct? Oh, no. I, I only – I barely graduated high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. then – oh, man, but that interview you described it like – um, you, you seem like a very intelligent man. And like the, it was, there was something funny that you said and made me laugh. It was like you, it was like a real humble flex and I liked it, but I want to get to that. Can you do, can you share again, like briefly, I know you've said it a dozen times, but like how you started in that, in your garage and you just out of necessity, you became an engineer and then you met with the devil wears Prada. Yeah. I mean, you know, back in the day I was, really just a computer nerd. I, I wanted to make video games was kind of like my, my lane that I was trying to be in. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was also in bands. I played drums, uh, played drums in a grindcore band. I played drums in metalcore band. We started doing shows. We ended up playing this show at this coffee shop with uh, the Devil Wears Prada. And I remember seeing their name on the flyer and being like, man, that's a really weird band name. What the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I saw their set and I was like, man, this is insane. I need to be a part of this. Like they were just doing something totally different than anybody else at the time. And it would really caught my attention. So I gave them a demo. Um, they kind of was just like, yeah, thanks. You know, but they didn't really like agree to do anything with me. And I followed up with them for like six months and they still, they were kind of just like, look, we want to just record ourselves. We don't really want to like go to a studio or anything. Yeah. So um, I begged them and begged them. And eventually it was just like, all right, listen, I'm going to charge you like literally 80 bucks, which is about how much it'll cost me for you to be here for two days uh, because my rent was like 500 bucks a month or whatever. And, uh, and, and I'll make the record. And if you don't like it, then whatever, you can move on and do something else. And yeah. so we made a five song EP. Um, called patterns of the horizon and then uh they got signed to rise records from that ep and then uh they ended up coming back to me to do the first full length record and that one that's that's an awesome and of course i was thinking you guys in a coffee were you guys so there were medical bands like in a coffee shop just like yeah we used to live like one of the guitar player in the band that i was in the band was called Coraline, and if you try to look it up you'll find nothing there's nothing online about it so sorry in advance but it was called <laughs> Coraline. Yeah. um and yeah and like we played shows there like like every like a couple times a month you know yeah um and it was just the local spot to play this was in richmond indiana mm -hmm. so yeah like I, I think you could probably fit like 200 300 kids in there maybe maybe 150 it's kind of hard to remember a little hazy memory from back then but yeah i played the drums and uh it was fun and That's um awesome. it was a good way to meet bands and you know, I'd been dabbling with recording anyway because I just wanted to record our own demo, our own album. Mm -hmm. um, all my friends were musicians, so they'd want to come over and record their stuff too. And yeah. so I just naturally ended up becoming this person that was in the hot seat, like whether I really wanted to or not, it just kind of happened, um, mm -hmm. you know. And then once I realized that other people thought that what I was doing was good, it kind of made me like become more interested in it. And, yeah. and I kind of pursued that path afterwards. Yeah. That's awesome. So let me, maybe I'm forgetting, um, but I think the devil, so what was the first album for the devil Wars Prada that you did with them? The title of that one? 
um, Dear Love, A Beautiful Discord. Yeah, I think. okay, so I remember that one, and that one was like a heavier, pretty a pretty heavy album. I just loved all the albums. They were so much fun. And then uh, and then you did pl- you did Plagues with them. Yep. So you did Plagues, and, and then Roots Above, which was, oh my, that's the album. When I first heard that, I was like, yes, this is Yeah, that, was, that album was a huge turning point for me because that's when I really started to have like more money um i could invest in better equipment um i was able to actually buy a house oh wow and then move into the house and then have a much better workspace yeah and that's why you hear those mixes improve because i literally just moved from like this tiny little hole in the wall garage thing to yeah. like a bigger like properly treated well it wasn't properly treated but it was better treated for mixing mm-hmm. And it had better speakers. I got yeah. like a, I got a proper desk. I got all these plugins. Like it just kind of was a, it was a level up on all pieces of the, of the, of the pie. Yeah. And um, that's that album. When you listen to plagues and then listen to um, roots above, like back to back, it's insane how much of a, you know, how much of a, how much progress that we all made, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh my God. Like just, yeah, I remember falling in love with those albums. It's kind of funny, but my friend, an old bandmate, he burned. Here's this band, you know, Devil Wears Prada, Roots Above, and it's just man, everything about that album. Like, I just wanted to be those guys. They were, they were just, they're amazing. <laughs> um, but the thing, here's the thing: when you were talking to Graham, and I, I kind of laughed too, and I was like, it was like a like a humble flex, as you said, uh, and it made me feel better because there's so many things I could talk about. Again, you know, we only have like less than an hour, but like, um, you didn't have a degree. And then you just kind of learned out of necessity in a way. And a lot of times, you know, maybe this is just my personal experience. There's a lot, a lot of times, you know, engineers, it's a very niche thing and it's kind of esoteric. And it's like, well, if you, you know, you need to go to audio school and you need, but you know, now with technology and social media, you know, if you still want to go to audio school, but I, I would say like, go, whatever works for you. And at the same time, I don't think it's always necessary. Like I'm a guitar player, but I didn't go to, you know, get my bachelor's degree in rock guitar. Like I just play guitar. It's art, you know? Um, and then you kind of say things like you were, I think you're a real humble guy because you said, um, I didn't know how a compressor worked for years. I even, and then you're like, I was just turn the knobs like, Oh, it's doing something. And then you go, uh, and that was like the humility side. And then you go, but now of course I build compressors. And I, I just, that's what made me laugh. Cause like, you know, that's like a, that's like a humble flex and a good, it was cool. You know? So you build your own compressors then. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely true. Like the, I think that um, I kind of boiled the whole college argument thing it, down to this idea that, you know, there's two different types of learners. There's people who will do whatever it takes to learn something they want to understand. Mm-hmm. And they actively proactively go after that topic and find and search to the deepest depths of information to find what they're looking for. Yeah. Those types of people don't need a rigid structure. They don't need to wake up at seven in the morning every single day to go to class or whatever, Mm -hmm. they're going to just go after it, which is, that's who I am. That's why I didn't need college. I think there's another set of people who won't do it on their own, but if they have that external force saying, got to go to class, got to get this paper done, got to learn about this thing, then that some people need that structure and and they can succeed too. And that's what college is great for, for providing that to those types of people. But you know, I think like anyone in this industry is going to quickly discover that it's so subjective and there's so many possibilities that there it's really hard to teach yeah. um, this subject. And the quicker you can get your hands on stuff and start doing it and having and failing and failing and doing yes. trial and error yes. and se- spending eight hours a day on the same mix for eight days in a row and still hating it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that. that's that's yeah. the school that you should go to that's that's what's going to make you better and i had years and years of that and um one thing i like to always say and i'm so grateful for this is that i learn something from every single project and every single band that i work with yeah and it's always something that comes just organically like i learned a lot about how to put things together when it came to like the devil wars product because i would You know, I'd be sitting there recording their songs and basically since I'm recording it, I'm dissecting it at the same time. I can mm-hmm. see what the drums do by themselves. I can see what the bass does. I can see what the guitars and and I can just remember moments like, you know, I'd be sitting next to Chris Ruby and he's playing like this riff. And like 
when I actually looked at his fingers on the fretboard and I thought in my head, I was like, that chord doesn't make any sense. You have dissonant frequencies, like you have notes that are next to each other and it's chromatic. But when you play it, it has a sound to it that actually works within the context of the of the D minor scale that you put before it and coming out of it. And so I'm just like, wow, like I'm learning something here. And so, you know, even though I don't have that formal training, I don't have that music theory background. I have all of the stuff that I've learned from all of my artists that has created who I am as a producer. And so that's what makes me unique. Yeah, very well said. Like, I thank you for sharing that, Joey. Um, You're going to say I call it because, yeah, I call it the school of trial and error. You know, that's the school Mm -hmm. I went to Um, because why the, I mean, like I said, I couldn't to reassure you, you know, like plagues like and um, beautiful discord like, you know, never once I was like, you know, this is a great album, but there's like something in the 322 hertz range and I just doesn't make, me, you know, I, no one's no one's going to do that, you know, at least in, uh, from my experience. Um, but it's funny because I know what you mean. Like I have my first mixes out there and I'm so scared to put them out and I'm like, I go back and I kind of cringe. I'm like four years ago. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, you know, like in this room, no treatment at all. Um, so, but I'm glad I put them out and like learn from them too. And that's, I think, I don't know, we could talk again, talk about this forever, but I feel like that's the test to see who's willing to do that and be vulnerable and put yourself out there. So that's cool that you did that. Um, and then I think I, well, let's see. Um, I guess it's kind of, you mentioned there was another band when you're talking to Graham and that again made me feel better and it's just I, i'm so glad you're willing to kind of put yourself out there and share it was there's another band you said you were going to work with and they were like a big i think you'll know the name I don't, um is it oceano or something like that is that right yeah yeah, yeah. and yep. the way you described it, it was almost like and, and maybe correct me if i'm wrong like you maybe experienced a little imposter syndrome right so you're going in absolutely and, yeah and you were a little you were like the way just i was nervous because these guys were so picky and like we need it just like this and you're like, what did I get myself into? And then the way he describes, like the next day I went in there and like put my head down, like, no guys, we're gonna, and you took charge and it, it was a success, right? Yeah, you know, that was an interesting project because I think it, I hadn't proven myself, at least in the death metal world um, yet. You know, I was still sort of like metal core guy, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't quite get as heavy as death metal does, right? Like. The, you know, a lot of metalcore doesn't really have blast beats, doesn't really get into the um, the uh, drop A sharp landscape, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so there's, And there's a lot of different techniques that go into capturing an album like that. So mm-hmm. they were not convinced, you know. A lot of bands would come in and just be like, yeah, Joey Sturgis, hell yeah, this is going to be great. And, you know, and, and so I, I thrived in that kind of environment. So when these guys came in and were just kind of like, we don't really know who you are, man, but this is how the record needs to be. I was like, oh, crap. So um, it really made me rise to the occasion. And and that's happened to me a few times in my career. And I'm thankful for those moments because those are the kind of moments that really like build you and take you to a new level. Um, and I when I go back and listen to that mix and that mix came out, I think, 2008, 2009. And here we are in 2023. It still sounds pretty great, man. Yeah. Like still stands up to a lot of death metal records that are coming out now. And um, and I've actually gone on to work with I'm still working with the band. We just did a, a we just did a new song that's out right now on their Spotify. So a lot of people also think that I'm not active anymore. And that's partially true. I did take a little bit of a break from producing for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm you know, now that I have JST and URM and Drumforge and all the things that I'm a part of, like. I have the luxury of just kind of choosing who I want to work with and getting on projects that I actually really like. So that's why I'm working with bands like Attack Attack, Conquer Divide, Oceano, yeah. Dayshell, for example, is I just like those bands. And yeah, I like... Uh, we should, sorry to interrupt, with Shaley, right? From uh, yeah. Man. Yeah, I've watched, yeah we, I've, been, I've been watching you guys on Instagram. So you're working with uh, with him and putting out a record soon? I've been a Dayshell fan since the beginning. Um, and uh, we just never, it just never crossed paths at the right time to work mm-hmm. together until now. Yeah. And um, so I just wrapped up recording with, with him and uh, all we're doing now is editing and mixing. So awesome. that album should be coming out this year. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. And then that reminds me, cause like, you know, I mean, again, I could chat about this forever, but like being a jack of all trades, there's some people who look down upon that surprisingly, at least from my experience, like, you know, cause I think to my understanding you did you did mix and master your own stuff, right? Most of the records that I did, like 
you could you could probably even put a percentage to it like some somewhere in the neighborhood of like 90 percent of the records that i worked on i did everything wow um okay. now sometimes i would bring people in to help like an editor or an engineer simply because you know we didn't have enough time like mm -hmm. if i have a band in the um in the studio and we have 30 days booked and they want to get you know vocals guitars bass drums all that stuff done well you start portioning it uh, portioning it out mm -hmm. partitioning it out and you're like okay well we have freaking six days to do like 10 tracks of vocals that means you have to sing more than one song in a day that's that's like impossible so yeah, yeah, the yeah. only way to speed it up is to grab another engineer and so now you could be yeah. recording you know guitars on this computer and then recording vocals on this computer at the same time now all of a sudden you have double the amount of time you know so we had to get into those kind of scenarios but yeah um i uh i just was grinding hard and mm -hmm. um and i i worked diligently to to have control over the entire record i did not want external mixers i knew that as soon as it left my computer mm -hmm. if it wasn't done it was going to get messed up yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so like I just made sure that my masters were great. I made yeah. sure my mixes were great because I didn't want anyone else to touch them. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I, I kind of get that way too because I do mix, I record my own stuff. Um, partly because it's like you know I'm at that place where I'm just you know freelancing and stuff, but then um, saving money. But then also uh, you know very to be transparent, like uh, maybe I can relate to you is that there is this selfishness of like it's mine. Like I want to put my like mix it and do some you know do you um use my ear and i don't want anyone to touch it because it'll get screwed up i mean we could say like there's people have demoitis and you know like you know things like that but and then the, there's some people like no send it out you know i want this guy's name on my record i want you know and that's okay or like send it out to this mastering engineer but like yeah there's just something about having full control or autonomy with your with your stuff that i, I can understand that so yeah. yeah, I, I, the, what really got me started in that was a moment that, um, I'll never forget. And it's, I wrapped up dear love, beautiful discord, um, with Prada. Yeah. The mix was done. Um, everything was approved, but we needed to master it. And this is before I created my mixing, mastering meshed pro process or whatever, where I mix and master at the same time. Um, I didn't know how to master. So mm. I kind of like played my cards wrong and, and didn't do the thing that I normally do, which is like, I pretend I can just figure it out. And then I do figure it out. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so back then I was just really straight up. I was just like, look, I don't know shit about mastering. So you guys, uh, you know, go get it done somewhere, I guess. Oh, okay. Um, and so they went to Chris Crummett and he mastered it. Oh, and the whole thing for me was, it was kind of like humiliating and and i was kind of ashamed that i didn't know how to do that mm -hmm. and so i was like all right i'm not gonna let this happen like ever again i'm gonna mm -hmm. spend the next four weeks like learning as much as i can about mastering like mm -hmm. doing test masters stuff like that so i did that and um yeah i just never let it happen to me ever again that was like the first time yeah 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 and i, I was just like okay i'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to learn how to master. <laughs> I'm going to want. Yeah. I feel like we're like very, I feel like I can identify with you a lot, Joey. Cause like, that's the same thing. Like maybe it's just my ego. Maybe it's partly ego or whatever, but it's also like, I just love to learn about mixing. It's just added this new dimension to everything and things to be aware of. And I'm just like, you know, like I always encourage people like, you know, I try to not be as, as with clients. I've had some clients to come in and track with me and like, you know, Hey, if you want to send it to a mastering engineer, like you have the money by all means go, you know what I mean? But then I've learned like basic mastering or anything, anything. I find something I can't do. I'm like, I'm going to learn that. I'm going to show you guys, you know? So I get that. Like you're, you're just kind of hungry and it's, it's just, it's fun. You know, it shows that you love, love the craft and love the art, you know? Um, let's see, we've got about half hour. Um, did you, what's like, let's get some fun questions. Like what was one of your favorite records or albums or artists to work with and kind of why, why it was your favorite? Um, well, you know, you're talking about a, let's see. When did I start? I'm all, I mean, man, I'm coming up on I'm getting close to 20 years ish now. Oh, nice. So you're talking about a very long span of, of projects, but, uh, I mean, I can tell you the most recent projects I've done have been really fun. Like the stuff that I just did with attack attack. I mean, it doesn't even feel like work. Like it's just like hanging out, like just 
talking about the songs, making them better. Like, it, you know, it's such a great time. We even, you know, want, part of the stuff we were doing was in the summertime. So we were outside grilling burgers, That's you know, the best. That's the best yeah. way to show up with your friends and, you know, Tar shows up an hour and a half late, but it's all good. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like play and I hang out this, um, this little pro studio up in, in North Hollywood because I'm, I'm in Los Angeles and they have that feel and I, and I hang out there and just show my face a lot. They have awesome crew and there's a TV in there and they'll take like, we'll just take, hey, let's go play Super Smash Brothers and we kind of like two hours go by. It's like, oh yeah, we got to get back to work. Yeah, dude, <laughs> like, that, We got to go or we got to do whatever we're supposed to be doing. So like, yeah, I get that's it. That's always the vibe in our studio too. We we had a big projector where we would have Mario Kart on there like with mm -hmm. Bless, Bless the Fall would be over. Oh, no. And uh, yeah, it would just be like, you know, race after race after race, three hours go by. You're like, oh shit, I got to record vocals. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <clears throat> yeah, that happened a lot. So yeah, those are the kind of projects that I really love. But like, there's also the kind of projects where you feel like you're kind of on to something. Like, like when I was doing Reckless and Relentless uh, with Ask Alexandria, I just remember that whole, actually even Stand Up and Scream, the whole thing just felt like, oh my God, we are on like, a whole new level wait till people hear this it's going to be crazy yeah. right so that 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 feeling is also really nice to chase um and really nice to be a part of yeah and uh so yeah those are the type of projects awesome awesome um let's see i mean yeah i don't even need you know much more of uh, your time like it's just you've answered a lot of my questions and i know you're busy but i guess give you some chance to um plug your stuff uh do you want to talk about sturgis tones because even i'm interested i'm starting to you know i'm working with this guy right now as a drummer and we're going to write some stuff and um so you do like and maybe i can use i'm interested in what you what you have it's like they're plugins essentially audio just like um or the amp sims or something like that is that for joey for your um, um so we're a software company that creates audio plugins for all digital audio workstations these are plugins that could be used on your mix, um, and part of your production process, whatever it is that you're doing in pretty much in the box, you're probably mm -hmm. going to be using plugins, right? Yeah. yeah. And we cl create all kinds of plugins. We have, uh, you know, drum compressors. We have vocal suites. We have amp sims. We have, um, you know, plugins that can help you remove cymbal bleed from your snare mic. Like oh, awesome. we have all all kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been I've been doing it for almost. 10 years now i think it actually might be in october it might be the 10th year mm -hmm. this year um yeah because we started in 2013 and it's 2023 so yeah in october it'll be our 10th year nice. um and uh yeah it's that's what i do day to day like you know every single day i wake up i run that company it, you know we're a team of 17 people we have you know a social media manager we have like uh, video production team like it's a whole big operation now mm -hmm. and um and i'm proud of it and yeah the prod the products that we make are a little different than what other companies like how they approach it because there's a lot of companies out there that will you know let's say emulate uh an 1176 yeah i can tell you that when i came up as a producer you told me about 1176 i'd be like you're speaking german i don't know what that is i don't know what it sounds <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. i don't know how to use it right yeah. So our company's philosophy is essentially to create solution based products. That means like, you know, you have a problem and you know that you need a solution for it. And our product is that solution. So let's say you're recording some real drums in your in your studio and you want to boost like a ton of 8K to get this certain set sound on your snare. But every time you do it, all of a sudden the crash symbol that's like three feet away from it starts to get really loud and sound really gross and nasty. And you can't do that boost because you have so much cymbal bleed coming into your snare mic. Well, you can use the JST Tominator plugin on it. And what that does is it puts a low pass filter that moves. So every time the snare hits, the low pass filter goes all the way to the to 20,000 hertz for just a split second. So you can get all of the frequencies of the snare hit and the transient. And then it clamps back down to the lower frequencies um, over a, like a bit of a ramp back down to like 200 Hertz so that you can then retain the low end information and all the symbols get pushed out. So okay. we create products like that. So, you know, if you were going to sit there and do that in your session manually, you'd be automating a little filter, like for every single hit and you'd have to go in there and draw it and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. do that thousands of times, or you just load this plugin and it does it for you. Right. Okay. 
So that's kind of like a, a gist of what we do. But we've also, like you, you mentioned AmSims. So we, we make a, a line of products called Tone Forge. And um, these are designed to be like, you just plug your guitar in and then inside the plugin is everything you need to create your guitar tone and also mix it and put it in your final mix. Awesome. So yeah, that's kind of a, out. yeah, that's check, just check out Joey Sturgis Tones. And you know, my big plug, I guess, is that, you know, we're about to drop one of the biggest products that we've been working on for two years now. And we're going to announce it on our Instagram pretty soon. So we're just asking people to go follow us on Instagram and check it out. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Joey. Two last ones. And then it, that's it is, um, are you going to be at Nam? Cause I, I live like an hour from Anaheim. So I was, if I can come say hi, um, are you, are you going to be there? Yeah, I'll be at Nam for the first two days. So that'd be, I think Friday, Saturday, right? Uh, well, there's a Thursday, Oh, there's a Thursday. Um, I okay. think there is. Okay, I'll double check. But um, is that just for see. like, what do you, what do you represent there at Nam? Is it um... JST? Is it, okay, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and then I guess you know, kind of something kind of fun is like what nugget of advice for new engin aspiring mixing engineers or producers or the old Joey who's in the garage, you know, doing that. What would you say for somebody to just keep going if they love doing this? Yeah, I mean, the thing that everyone wants to believe is that there's this overnight success, but overnight success happens after you've put in 10 years of work. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, you know, the easiest way to lose is to give up. And yeah. you're also never going to feel like you're ready to do something. So I always say start before you're ready. Basically, all that means is just jump in the deep end of the pool, figure out how to swim, like, Otherwise, you can take lessons until you're blue in the face. But if you don't actually go out there and try, yeah. um, you're, you're never going to get anywhere. So just start before you're ready and don't ever give up. And that's I think that's the best advice I could give anybody. OK, Joey, thank you very much for taking your time. I know you're, you're busy, but it just means a lot. And I'm, I'm really grateful. It was a privilege. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I hope your listeners, uh, your audience gets something out of this. You guys can all follow me on Instagram. I, I answer all my DMs. So yeah. you haven't moved, made the move to TikTok yet? Nah. Yeah, yeah. I know you're on. I know you're on TikTok. I, yeah, I yeah, checked yeah. out your TikTok, but I, I yeah. I'm 38, man. I think I'm a little too old for that. No, I understand. <laughs> I was. I just think. Yeah, that's really funny. But okay. All right. Thank you, Joey, very much for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. All right. Take care.